but I do want to talk about the fact that the the modern imagination is often haunted by these ideas of unique catastrophic points that will lay waste to everything. But in fact, what usually happens, what's harder to imagine is something that's kind of subcatastrophic and yet very large in its effect. So there, you know, along the left, there's this phrase, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. I think Slavoj Žižek says that. I think Frederick Jameson says that. Uh, my twist on that would be to say it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it, than it is to imagine huge transformations in the world that don't quite rise to the level of the end of the world. So if you think about the, the advent of atomic weapons and go back and look about what people were worrying about, what they were worrying about was the total extinction of the human race, which could happen, right? I suppose we, if all the nuclear weapons on the earth are fired accidentally or deliberately, it could end the world as we know it through nuclear winter, but that's not really what happened. What happened were major transformations in the security situation, the advent of the Cold War, uh, the continuing possibility of the use of tactical nuclear weapons in limited nuclear wars, which people have forgotten about, but it's looking more likely in the future. Um, in the political imagination, people continue to imagine revolution because the alternative seems to be peaceful reform that won't get the job done. But there might be something like renovation that involves completely changing subnational institutions that, that thoroughly govern the way that we live. It's much easier to imagine totally laying waste to the entire system or power structure as it exists and somehow replacing it with something either utopian or people imagine far better than this. Um, and so if we apply that same kind of uh, dynamic to the question of artificial intelligence, uh, people talk about the singularity when I think what's harder to think about is what's going to happen if there's an extreme form of intelligence augmentation. For example, the, the uh, complete transformation of the human sensorium uh, using artificial technologies, right? things like our being able to maybe see ultraviolet lights or to calculate certain things very quickly, uh, what that might mean for our institutions, for our day-to-day -day life, and uh, again, it's hard to imagine by its very nature. So I'm not sure uh, what it would look like, but I think that at least sets the terms for some possible discussion. I'm skeptical of the idea that there's going to come, come a point where humans are simply no longer, we either annihilated by machines or we're parasites sitting around as machines do all the work. Um, in our architecture isn't my field, but I teach at an architecture school. And so architects are now toying with the idea that there will be a kind of architectural singularity in the next few decades at which a machine will be able to design buildings as well as any human with the result that buildings will become commodities. And so the individual signature of an individual architect won't matter. Um, what that fails to take into account is that there still needs to be the architectural consumer. There still needs to be the consumer, the critic, the connoisseur who, who, uh, selects between different computer designs, right? You're still going to be there deciding which design the computer makes uh, is the best and then adopting that. So there will still be a role for humans, at least as the aesthetic connoisseurs or the passive consumers of the products of machines, unless we are annihilated. But by hypothesis, I'm saying human annihilation is a very unlikely uh, scenario. Uh, yes, another example I was going to give <coughs> is the climate crisis. Uh, people talk about extinction, even though, again, extinction could happen. I won't say it could happen. What's more likely is 70 to 80 to 90 percent of humans being killed <laughs> and the total transformation of civilization as we know it. So, again, that intermediate subcatastrophic state is often what happens with major changes, but it's also the hardest uh, space in which to think because we, we like to think either in terms of catastrophe or in terms of piecemeal reform or small alteration, which many people don't find sufficient. So that's going to be the framework for, for the other remarks I make today. And I, I think I have a few more minutes left, but I will, I will call close to it there. Great, thank you for that. Um, is there any question from the audience or maybe from the other panelists? Great, um, we'll start off with Sean and then have the question from Michael. Um, 
Hi. Hi, Graham. Thank you very much for that very brief but quite provocative um, introduction. Um, one thing that was occurring to me, I mean, I take your point that um, our imaginary is kind of scuppered by this choice between kind of things continuing as they've always been or uh, there being some kind of catastrophe that from from the point from which all things change. Um, and in some ways you seem to be suggesting that there's this almost uh, or there's this potential for kind of middle way here where there's at least this that uh, humanity um, engages in form of kind of we become these augmented creatures. Uh, where particularly we're talking about kind of um, our, our perhaps physical or sensorial capacity um, is able to kind of engage with the worlds around us in a, in a quite uh, tech technologically augmented state. Now, I think we should recognize, of course, um, that the number of human beings that are going to be able to access that degree of, of technological augmentation, intelligence augmentation or, or whatever, are likely to be as limited as the world in which we exist at the moment is limited in terms of various forms of social inequalities. Um, where is the catastrophe, uh, where is the avoidance of catastrophe, I guess I want to say, is when this form of technological augmentation actually reinforces the amount of inequality um, that exists in the world, if not exacerbates it and is that not in itself the actual catastrophe rather than uh the kind of annihilating catastrophe which you're saying is kind of limiting the way in which we think about these things i think that's exactly the point i would say uh it, it was going to allow for a human physical and mental diversity in a harmful sense, right? Just as you pointed out, certain people have access to these incredibly augmenting things. Other, it's been talked about for years that some people may be outfitted with gills so that they can be sewer workers or lifeguards. And so you could have a completely new form of what we know as racism that is grounded in uh, actual physical differences and actually mental differences enhanced by technologies. There's a built-in democracy to humans, a democratic baseline in the sense that we all basically have the same mental and physical capacities with slight differences. Once those differences are, are augmented beyond our current imagination, then yes, I think, I think you put your finger on the real danger. Not a catastrophe of extinction, but a catastrophe in the sense of which humans become like ants or bees with different physical and mental castes. That is something that I worry about. Thank you. Great. But I'm Thank sorry, can I just follow, come, come back on that? Um, so, I mean, doesn't that then mean that we almost need to hold on to the kind of measure or the framework of catastrophe in which, in order to kind of engage with thinking about this potential future? We need the idea of catastrophe almost to kind of structure or hold back how we're going to um, how we're going to think these things through and and the kind of ethical dimensions of the decision making not that this will necessarily of course you know it's always going to be corporate driven but um in the ways in which at least at the governmental level decisions come to be made about these things we need the catastrophic imaginary to hold back from this um potential future it has a value right it has a utility I think being afraid has a utility. Uh, the problem with catastrophic thinking is it can lead to a certain conservatism, right? It can lead to the notion that we need to call a halt to the direction in which things are going and somehow go back to something. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the right way to approach it. I think because, for instance, that might suggest that there shouldn't be any intelligence augmentation at all. And there might yeah, no, understood. But there are different ways of imagining catastrophe. I'm thinking here particularly of Afro-pessimist understandings of, you know, the kind of epistemological catastrophe that they understand to be the necessity uh, in order to kind of change the structure of society as one premised on anti-blackness, where, um, and, and, and so they're suggesting, you know, Wilderson is suggesting there needs to be this epistemological catastrophe for there to be enough change. Not all catastrophes are catastrophic, right? Um, 
And so I would kind of want to hold on to the value or the utility of that as an idea, uh, whilst recognizing, as, as you say, that there's always that option to, to drift into uh, conservatism, to, to refuse the future, to refuse the possibility or potential, all that comes with technology that is valuable, mm -hmm. but equally dangerous. I think sometimes we need to look at a different set of actors than we're used to looking at. For instance, you said it will always be corporate driven. Are you sure that it will always be corporate driven? Aren't there vulnerabilities in the corporation uh, that we don't suspect where it could be subverted from beneath by perhaps not individual actors, but sub-corporate actors? And it's, it's hard for me to imagine what those might be. Um, or when we think yeah, in terms of- it is. It's hard to imagine. I think that's the point, yeah. Or when we think in terms of capital as a totality, it yeah. somehow governs everything. I'm not sure that there ever was a totality. And so the, the resources for overcoming uh, uh, potentially catastrophic situations might come from smaller sized actors than we're used to looking at. I know that's very general, but that's- Yeah, maybe. I'm trying to start with a general framework here. Yeah. Great, okay. thank you for that discussion. Up too much time. Great, sure. That's all right. Um, thank you for that discussion. It was fascinating. I'm sure we can pick up on some of those things in the discussion later on. Um, Michael, you may ask your question. Yeah, thank you for that. I thought that was really, I thought that was really interesting. So I think um, what I found interesting was firstly that your point that um, this kind of death drive, this result of death drive is, is easier kind of to imagine than a partial um, death drive. I thought that was, um, I thought that was a really interesting point. And it's something that I find aligns with my, my own politics as I try to destroy everything rather than these kind of smaller reforms. Um, and your point on this um, catastrophe as being this kind of like necessary uh, requisite almost was something that I thought was, um, or at least the point made that catastrophe is a necessary requisite is, is definitely an interesting one that is, is discussed elsewhere and things like politics of anxiety and, and how um, insurance companies and, and, and so on and so forth and the police function on this kind of constant sounding of the alarm. Um, but my, my question is, is slightly off that point. So you, uh, on, when you were talking earlier about uh, architecture and how if we have this kind of architectural singularity that then uh, it is machines making buildings uh, and rather than it being architects and that lack of a signature, but instead then um, you, 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 you coined uh, uh, aesthetic connoisseurs. Um, and, and the question I have about that, so you're saying that uh, the future then becomes only one of, of consumers rather than kind of active participants. So in, in which case then humanity is rendered passive rather than active in the world. So my question is then, do you not think that that rendered us, renders us no longer participants, but um, kind of bodies to be affected? Well, there would still be a choice though. Uh, an element of choice in the connoisseur that the, the you are presented with a, an array of options and uh, you have to judge or sort or somehow do something with the options that have been presented to you. What, what I was thinking of is about how both Nietzsche and Heidegger make this big uh, storm out of approaching aesthetics from the artist's point of view rather than the beholder's point of view. And they, they introduce this idea with this air of superiority as though there's something horribly passive about the other Kant's way of looking at aesthetics, someone being a disinterested judge. But uh, I began asking myself if that's really true, right? That there's aesthetic experience is passive in a sense. I mean, there's the artist who creates art, but at a, in a certain level, the artist is also an aesthetic I don't want to say consumer, but an aesthetic recipient, someone who's also a beholder of their own artwork. And I would say that that's really where art is. That's aesthetics is about appreciating something that's given to you. It may be produced by you, but ultimately if it's produced by you, it's produced by you in order to be enjoyed by you. Right. And actually Nietzsche, Nietzsche calls that uh, the woman's aesthetics, that of the passive <clears throat> beholder. And so that's another clue that, um, we might want to re revise how the term woman's aesthetics is viewed. It could be viewed as something positive, even if we don't want to associate it with women in that kind of uh, uh, 
metaphysical way in the bad sense or in essentialist way in the bad sense. Uh, but in the case of architecture, you would still need uh, to choose from all the different uh, possible designs that the machine is kicking up. And that might actually, it could actually improve a given field. If a machine is producing many different options that the human can then examine and choose from, it might simply be, there's a microphone on somewhere. It might actually turn out to be a situation. Oh, that's, that's me. I'm getting feedback from my own. Okay. I was hearing myself echoed a few seconds later. Uh, it might actually create a situation where the usual grunt work of human aesthetic production or intellectual production is gone. And we can focus on what I would call the real work of connoisseurship, not to beat that term to death, but selecting from among the various options that are produced uh, for us. Yeah. So um, if I can just quickly come back. So um, in which case then it's kind of in this Marcusean critique of, of unproductive labor or rather kind of menial labor, then instead then we're able to kind of transcend that and enter into a kind of more realm of, of eros and something that isn't quite then having to do the actual creating, but rather than the, the activeness comes in into a point where we aren't having to um, engage in the, the lower ranges of, of production. Is that, is that then the point? It, it wouldn't have to be lower necessarily, but it's something that a machine might be able to replicate, such as filling in the details of an architectural design, uh, generating all the possible eight to 10 solutions to a problem, and allowing the architect to examine them and, and select from them. So and, and I don't know enough about the specifics uh, of what that would entail, but I, I do think the idea that architects would disappear seems a rather hasty uh, notion. What's more likely is that the profession of architecture transforms into something completely different, much as in some ways the, the profession of the artist changed into something different once uh, individual craftsmanship by hand became less important to what art was doing than the underlying conceptual choices. Uh, I think in the 60s was the first time an artist actually commissioned the physical work to craftsmen rather than carrying it out herself. Uh, Annie Truitt, I think it was, who came up with the idea and she hired some carpenters to actually carry out the work. And there are all kinds of examples of that now. Uh, and so possibly something like that uh, will happen. Thank you. Sure. Great, thank you for that. Michael, can you let me know how we're doing on time? Can we, can we have another question? Uh, we have two minutes left of the, the whole, this portion. All right, in which case, are there any other questions? Um, on the floor? If not, uh, then I will just ask for a, yeah. Okay, Tristan, go ahead. Um, I find it completely arbitrary that aesthetic appreciation, your way of depicting the artist as someone who merely enjoys their work after completing it. I don't, it doesn't make much sense to me because the process of making art is in itself the active movement, the active in creation, because it doesn't become a single piece of art. It is a form. Various ideas come through onto the tapestry, onto a composition. These movements all take their time in collaboration with others, with yourself, or in, a, in an environment where you have a restricted use of the materials you have in front of you. In all these kind of ways, I don't understand then how it will disappear or how it's just a simple uh, matter of choosing an artwork and then just contextualizing it in order to be structural in the sense of the architect. Because um, the way you're making it sound, it's quite like what happened recently, where they got some 27 tapes and they made songs by uh, Nirvana um, using AI and processing all of their songs on there. But they weren't, they were, they were songs, but they weren't really great songs at all. And whilst it can be interesting to have an AI create things, there is no reason in my mind to remove the essence of work and aesthetic appreciation from the artist in that sense. Does that make any sense or? Yeah, it does. Um, here's what I would say. I would say that in some ways, the position of the spectator or the beholder is to be envied. I remember a comment by John Coltrane where he said that he envies people who were hearing his, his music for the first time. Um, he wishes he could do that again, uh, but he can't. 
I find this uh, myself that I cannot reread my own books. I don't enjoy it. Uh, once in a while, I find a sentence that I'm proud that I wrote, but I avoid it because if I reread one of my own books, too many memories come in of where I was sitting when I wrote that exact sentence or what my mood was that day. And it becomes ruined by all these extraneous autobiographical factors. I'm not unable to read my books as books quite often. And so I, again, I envy those who are reading them for the first time, much in the manner of John Coltrane. And so uh, uh, I think a lot of, for a lot of artists and writers, they aspire to be people looking at their own work from the outside. Uh, you seem to be interpreting art as a kind of action. I was thinking, uh, funny, I was reading right last night about interpretations of Jackson Pollock from the uh, mid 20th century. And of course there was the formalist interpretation of Pollock that he's the greatest painter of his time. And if you just look at what he's doing, the paintings themselves are very fine. And then there were those who were never convinced and, and called it action painting and said that what it's about is a kind of performance where Jackson Pollock is using the canvas as the record of an event rather than as a freestanding artwork. Um, and I'm not sure that that works. I think at a, a certain point, a decision is made as to what's inside the artwork, what's outside the artwork. And so ultimately, I would say an artwork can't be just an event. It has to be a self-contained work. And what, as soon as you have that, you need someone to be experiencing the work and enjoying it. And what, what I'm trying to get at here is the idea that we could have a an architecture or an art that are not catastrophically different from what we have now or not erased, but somehow different by a few orders of magnitude while still being recognizably art or architecture. Great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we can take maybe two minutes. Um, I'll pause the recording briefly and then we will come back uh, with Anton Jaeger. That, does that sound good? Yeah, mm -hmm. all right, great. Uh, so we meet back at 32. All right then, I think we can now commence again. So our next speaker is uh, Anton Jaeger. Um, he is a postdoctoral fellow, a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Cambridge, working on the history of populism in the United States. And together with uh, Daniel Zamora, he's currently working on an intellectual history of basic income. And on this topic of basic income and populism, he has published widely. I believe he's currently working uh, on a on a project, welfare without the welfare states, a modern history of basic income. And I think I believe in two thousand eighteen, he produced uh, he published a book called. Uh, a brief history of populism. Um, I'm particularly personally happy to uh, introduce Anton because we ha we, ha we happen to attend the same secondary school when uh, he was a senior, I believe, when I was when I when I just began, uh, and he was kind of a bit of a legend back then. So, <laughs> if without further ado, uh, Anton, please take it away. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, apologies, it took, it took a while to unmute. Uh, I was completely unaware of uh, that reputation, so I'm glad, I'm glad to hear about that. Um, and I'm gonna issue a slight correction, it's meant to be a short anti-history of populism. So I'm not giving a history, but of course it covers many of the same themes and I think the ambition is slightly different. Um, today I'm gonna be talking about something that's not necessarily related to the populism research, but which has some overlap with it. Um, and which also has I think a uh, rather tangential but interesting relationship to AI, so far as I'm going to abuse the uh, concept of AI to very much talk about welfare politics and what type of welfare politics we've seen arise in response to the COVID crisis. So I think anyone who thinks about it can see the relationship between AI and the need for a basic income. So far as AI is seen as a main driver of automation across all sectors, many of the service economy, which then stimulate the need for the basic income. So that's an external relationship between AI and basic income. But there's also an interestingly internal relationship between AI and basic income insofar as both AI and concept of basic income share a necessity of what we call to automate certain forms of decision making. It's a way of depoliticizing certain forms of statehood applied to machinery, AI eliminates the need for labor applied to the state, AI eliminates the need for bureaucratic domination. And on that level, you can see there's a very interesting relationship between AI and basic income as such. 
Now, of course, I have to start with the notion of a crisis or the notion of a sub-catastrophe that Graham nicely mentioned in his talk, um, which is that 2020 has been a very, very good and propitious year for the basic income proposal. And this is not surprising because as Milton Friedman himself said once, only a crisis, real or perceived, produces real change. So he chose to close the foreword to his book, Capitalism and Freedom, which was reissued in 1982, the beginning of the Reagan revolution, which was already a bestseller when it first appeared in 1962, but which was enjoying a sort of rapid resurgence in the era of Thatcher and Reagan. Now, inevitably, the mantra that freedom chose to close that conclusion will also sound familiar to today's UBI enthusiast. Uh, so 2020 and certainly 2021 has been a boon to their cause. Although no government actually legally passed the proposal into law, we're seeing a variety of policy experiments, and certainly with the current Biden package that got through, which is moving closer and closer to the real thing. So for example, in late March 2020, um, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, the US sent a $1,200 Trump check to many American citizens, and most European countries, for example, have automated access to their unemployment insurance since the onset of the pandemic. But we can even see this in the global south with someone like Jair Bolsonaro, who is not particularly on the left of the political spectrum, but who has ramped up Brazil's cash transfer machine mainly to assist the country's poorest citizens, not only in the favelas, but in the large informal economy that Brazil has. Now, we don't need to overplay the importance of basic income or cash transfers in the crisis fighting after 2020. Um, we have large quantitative easing operations, which we're familiar with. Uh, we also have very targeted interventions in healthcare markets. Sometimes we have expropriation of empty housing. And of course, within the sort of policy milieu, there are a variety of alternatives that also circulate. Uh, we have proposals for job guarantee, which we're familiar with. Um, and there is also a growing movement for what's called universal basic services or the reinvention of public goods in the public sector. Yet in our sort of increasingly zoomified and digital world in which AI is supposedly on the brink of annihilating a large sector of uh, the workforce um, and in an economy which is still reeling from extended lockdowns, it's clear that the proposal for a basic income or cash transfers, which are paid to everyone continuously and unconditionally is very much built for durability. Now, what are the explanations for this? Well, the first one is just primarily economic. Uh, we have millions and millions of people which are either under or unemployed in an increasingly informal economy. We have states who feel far more comfortable with doing sort of targeted intervention, mainly in financial markets, where they furnish liquidity to banks, for example, with quantitative easing. And then if you look at that particular mode of crisis fighting, quantitative easing for the people as basic income is known, appears as a cheap and easy way of providing welfare. Um, so why could we not extend the generosity which has been extended to banks, to individuals at this time? Um, and interestingly, for example, Janet Yellen, who's the US's new Treasury Secretary under Biden, has already announced tax credit payments with central bank assistance, but there's a variety of other cash relief measures, which you can also see in the Biden package. Now, interestingly, when we look at this from a global perspective, uh, it's clear that the global South arrived at this cash transfer consensus much earlier than Europe and the United States. And this has to do with the fact that after the large structural adjustment programs of the 1980s and 1990s, which you might know forced a lot of countries to repay their IMF loans by pushing through very, very punishing labor market reforms and by privatizing large parts of their public sectors, many of these developing nations or former developing nations found themselves without adequate state capacity to support their population. And so whether we were in Brazil, South Africa, or even India, cash transfers then became a sort of attractively simple way of doing welfare in an age of declining institutional capacity and an age of ascendant neoliberalism. And an interesting thing happened in the 2010s when Europe seemed to undergo its own structural adjustment program, uh, program sorry, in the Eurozone, where, for example, Greece and Italy had to implement very, very harsh labor market reforms and had to reduce their public debt. But then you could see that the idea of cash transfers finds its way back to the old world and the periphery very much prefigures what happens in the center. Now, this is the economic picture. It's a very important picture, but economics can't explain everything here. Um, so more than economic necessity, what has been called the new politics of distribution of cash transfers also has to do with much deeper structural changes in how our contemporary democracies function. And we can see this when we look back at the 1930s, which is a sort of previous area in which we, we saw mass unemployment and mass crisis take over the entire world. And when people were forced into destitution at the time, um, 
the first response was not fighting for free cash, but rather you had mass parties and unions which pushed for the removal of entire areas of human life from the market altogether. And of course, we saw the results of this in public health care programs, which were implemented after the war, uh, social housing projects, which mainly Britain was very famous, or uh, large public works programs, such as the Tennessee Valley Authority that Roosevelt implemented, and of course, the arrival of free education, mainly across the Western world. And in the 1950s and 1960s, as you have the so-called developmental moment in the third world, a lot of these welfare programs are then extended by radical anti-colonial activists who very much seeks to reproduce their own welfare states in the third world. Now, what we need to remember about the specific welfare regime that arose out of the Second World War is that it relied on a very humanist or sort of strongly normative view of human needs. So there's an interesting relationship to the kind of humanism we see with the AI now. Um, and first, this humanism or this notion of what a human requires and what a human is was very much based on a male breadwinner uh, factory worker, so a blue collar worker who worked in a factory. But in the 50s and 60s, certainly with the rise of feminist movements and uh, other movements of the market, you can see that this welfare vision is extended onto other subjects as well. And interestingly, for a lot of people, this vision actually implied a very strong distrust of cash transfer approach or the idea that you could solve uh, poverty and market dependency on the capitalism by just sending over cash to people. Um, and we can look at, for example, the English economist Arthur C. Pigou, who was not particularly a socialist, but was part of the tradition of welfare economics, who famously justified equality on the grounds that it would increase the total welfare of society. So as he said, any transfers, a transference sorry, of income from a relatively rich man to a relatively poor man must increase the aggregate sum of satisfaction within society. Now he thought that this could not simply be done by dispensing cash because welfare is liable to be modified by the manner in which income is spent. And the reflex effect on people's character of public museums or even of municipal, uh, municipal baths, sorry, is very different, uh, different from the effect of equal satisfactions in a public bar. You see the same sentiment by William Beveridge, who was very much the liberal architect of the British welfare state, who thought that, well, what we don't need is a price system which is driven by sovereign consumers, but uh, a democratically controlled state which needs to secure the allocation of concrete goods. So the ordering of British society after total war would have to be a matter of public choice, not simply individual consumer choice. Now, of course, I'm talking about academics here uh, who tend to overstate their influence in some matters, but of course they were not the strongest buttresses for this specific vision at the time. So outside of academia, you have parties and unions and other civil society organizations that also articulate and defend specific needs to a redistributive and a planning state. And then, of course, in the 1970s, um, you have a drop in the profit rate, certainly, certainly across the West people and businesses find it unable to make a profit. And that leads capitalists to seek a break from this post-war welfare settlement. And as a consequence, this welfare order that both Pibu and Beveridge proposed at the time enters into a fatal and terminal crisis. But interestingly enough, we're talking about a sort of economic crisis here, but the crisis of that welfare ideal had actually started much early already. And it was presaged in what is called the economics profession. Uh, so in the 50s, Beveridge and Pico's views came under attack in what is called the neoclassical revolution, which recast a price system as a more efficient instrument to distribute goods. Uh, rather Apologies than the for the interruption, but uh, we're trying to stay a bit on track. Do you, uh, would, do, would it be possible to uh, bring things a bit to a close? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, how, how many minutes do we have left? Uh, we're trying to do the q a fully uh for your part by okay no problem, uh, no problem. i'm almost yeah i'm almost okay, okay thank you thank you no uh, to to conclude it's clear that for example in the economics uh, profession and then paired with this economic crisis we're seeing with 2020 the left-wing appeal of cash transfers is very very intuitive uh, it has to do with ai induced automation and the fact that it is a less punitive and more efficient solution to some of the welfare programs that have been eliminated in the last 30 years. But at the same time, they also fit with an increasingly individualist and abstract notion of democracy in which we actually find it unable to agree on what our concrete and shared needs are across society. So as I say, a class society which cannot agree on anything can at least agree that people need money. So in this sense, we, I think basic income has very much become the distant horizon of our new welfare world. It, 
doesn't only have to do with AI or the rise of a specific new state. We might not get there anytime soon, but everything already happens under its sign. And I'm just going to close there and I'll await your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk, Anton. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, we'll now take. We'll now just take any quick questions. Are there? Are there any questions? Okay. Okay. I think we can start then. Uh, Michael, please. Yeah. Thank you for that. I thought it was really interesting. It's. Um. I. I study philosophy, so the, the amount of forays I have into economics is. Um. Is depending on your view. A uh, few, whether that's positive or negative, we have yet to find out. Um, but so I, I think my the, the issue for me is uh, that we we aren't clear yet on on what we need, because I think that there's been um, a, a large amount of consensus that the the provision of kind of housing, uh, of access to material goods like food, water, etc., uh, and so on and so forth, that those kind of uh, material existence uh, or the the provisos of material existence are generally agreed upon that we require, um, but the question I have is, it, is it not then in the case that it's not what humans require that we're debating over, but rather who is doing the provision? So by that, I mean, we can take that in an economic sense of should it be uh, the individual who um, in this kind of meritocratic narrative gets up and does it themselves? Should it be the state? Should it be companies? But I think also to, to drag in AI, uh, if we're looking at the construction of robots, how should these humanoids look? As we see so frequently, it's uh, it, it's women it's that are created as these these AI robots uh, and uh, often kind of Aryan style robots. So in which case then, is it not consensus on need, but rather on provision that we require? Yeah, good question. I think the two uh, questions are actually inextricably linked. So I don't think you can separate the question of needs determination from the question of provision insofar as if you agree that a democratic state has to do the provision, then that implies a certain theory of needs and how theory, uh, how needs are formed. Um, so I think the illusion of basic income is that you can delay that the question on normative needs by just delegating to individual choices and therefore to the market. But at the same time, normativity always sneaks in through the back door in the end. And you can see this in the examples you gave of AI mainly being modeled on certain yeah, forms of female sexual access, accessibility, for example, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also clear that most of the AI we've actually become familiar with in the last 20 years don't actually eliminate human labor, but seek to increase control and seek to increase the amount of coercion you can exercise over labor. So what you see is the elimination of middle management rather than the elimination of all these jobs in the service sector. So there the question of provision and the question of needs determination are actually one and the same because the agent you choose for your needs determination actually also determines what kind of provision you're going to be doing. So if private companies do it, or if individuals do it, or if a specific kind of state does it, or if a civil society organization does it, you're already working with a different theory of needs. Um, so I think it's just a proxy for that second question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so Anne, please. Great. Um, thank you for that. I thought it was really interesting. I'm becoming increasingly interested in this potential that universal revenue might have. Um, specifically here in France, we have a, a presidential candidate that really is promoting it, um, Benoit Moore, and I, I'm just very, very interested in seeing what that can mean. I have a question, though, about the place of platform capitalism and maybe how it works in, in delaying this um, push for universal revenue. I think it really has made it so easy um, and accessible to engage in labor um, that perhaps it's it's blocking the pathway to universal revenue. I wonder if you have anything to say about that. Yeah, excellent question. Um, I think there is a correlation between the popularity of the sort of cash transfer consensus or the movement for basic income and the rise of what is called platform capitalism. Because platform capitalism, um, although it's oversold as this big technological revolution, is actually just about um, squeezing as much surplus out of labor as is pos uh, potentially possible. So it's not a particularly dynamic or innovative um, system either. Um, it's, as I said, mainly a way of algorithmically controlling how people work. You can see this with delivery drivers to uh, the contemporary gig economy, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, what's typical of platform capitalism is that it doesn't imply any sort of uh, concrete models for wage growth. Uh, it's meant to keep wages quite low because people are quite flexible and have to just accept any gig that's given to them. 
But there, it's true that it delays cash transfers insofar as people are available to work so they can get all kinds of uh, sources of revenue elsewhere. But at the same time, precisely because it's a low growth and low wage model, uh, cash transfers offer a kind of minimum security for people to still be forced to accept all these kind of al algorithmic uh, labor markets on that level. So the question is, for example, um, what you see with Walmart is that a large part of the wage bill of Walmart is paid with um, social security budgets, which are actually expanded by American states. And in that sense, the state just finances the fact that Walmart can't uh, give its workers a proper wage. And I think there is a danger that basic income actually has the same effect in that new platform economy is that it normalizes all those new forms of domination that come with platforms, while at the same time not actually rechanging what kind of contracts and what kind of um, yeah, what kind of labor people perform, because it depoliticized the question of how we actually want to structure the world in which we work and the structured world in which we labor. Great, thank you. Yes, um, Theo, did you did you have a question or? Uh, it, it wasn't a particularly uh, sophisticated one and we've reached time, uh, which means we can take a break here. Alternatively, uh, if people do want to stick around, I can I can voice my question. I think there's um, there's time for one more question, um, so that we finish at fifty five, take a five minute break, and be back here at six. Okay, sounds good. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very insightful. Um, I wanted to ask. It seems to be that artificial intelligence might be the sort of driving force for the necessity of a universal basic income. Uh, and again, this is a sort of very crude speculative question, but um, would it also sort of uh, potentially be a means of uh, artificial intelligence? Could it potentially also be a means of um, determining the needs of the individual and then allocating resources for it, if that makes sense? It kind of goes a bit against the notion of a universal basic income as being sort of flat across the board, but uh, it seems better suited uh, to, on a large scale, more effectively meet the needs of uh, the individuals? Yeah, there, there's two questions there. Is, uh, what, what, what do you see as a means? Do, do you determine needs in a purely monetary sense? So is it just a lack of purchasing power? Is it the fact that people don't have enough money? Or do you want to determine needs in a more strongly humanist and normative way to say like, well, we have a basic set of needs, which includes housing, education, um, several access to a job, then you're already talking a different uh, jargon, while at the same time, what you, for example, see with some of these platform companies like Amazon is that precisely because they gather so much consumer data and they feed it to all these machine learning devices, it does actually reveal a sort of very interesting area for human, human exploring how human needs are formed. Um, so they can now compile individual profiles for all kinds of consumers. They know what they buy. And I mean, to put it really crudely, Google now knows you're gay before you know you're gay yourself. That level. So that is just a radical vision of uh, how these algorithms reshape such activity on a certain level. And that also implies, of course, that you're going to be making uh, or pulling certain conclusions about needs determination. But I think we need to be very clear that so many of these algorithms we know, uh, certainly for Amazon, in the new platform economy, are so geared towards profit maximization. Um, they're not actually about making sure that people can communicate what they actually need, but that people can communicate things which might potentially be profitable to companies, that there's a real question whether you can actually recuperate these, um, these technologies. Um, and for example, it's just very clear that what you see with Amazon, and it doesn't only have to do with the deterioration of its product, is that um, a lot of the times people don't actually know what they want, and they might actually feed the machines certain data which might maximize the profits of Amazon, but it's not clear that society actually needs the, these particular needs to be fulfilled in the first place. Um, I think the best example, for example, is that the pharma industry spent the most, the entirety of the 2000s, um, really spent a lot of money on Viagra pill development rather than on vaccine um, production. And of course, from a market-based point of view, that makes sense because people who need Viagra um, are more wealthy, can put more money into medicine. So it makes sense to 
prioritize it from a private sense. Uh, Amazon will probably gather a lot of data about what kind of agar pills different consumers need. But if you then look at 2020 and how the pandemic overtook the world, suddenly you saw that the pharma industry was also woefully behind on vaccine development for what turned out to be a very, very urgent threat. And there, there's just a question of like, okay, yes, um, these new platforms can help us determine new needs. But the question is, are these valuable needs in themselves? And are these needs determined democratically? And there, the, yeah, the, the problematic gets much, much murkier. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for for your for your presentations and your and your answers, uh, Anton. So, and because now we'll take a five minute break. Well, I think we'll we can we'll come back here at six. So. Power as a projectile that would discipline and as we all know, the biological and social stimulation of the family leads to private reflection outside party needs. Unorthodox loyalties which can only lead to thought crime. There is truth and there is untruth. I'm taking this phrase from a particularly compelling yet also utterly discomforting section of the trailer to the movie of George Orwell's novel 1984 with which we have started this presentation. In this probably most famous depiction of a dystopian future where free thinking is considered a thought crime, there was still room for resistance exactly because the delineation between right and wrong was still visible, still to be grasped and used as catalyst for an emancipated social movement in the name of some abstract notion of freedom. This is a good example for a certainty of a world that we are departing. The future of politics will be a perfectly staged untruth that we accept as reality. Technopolitics driven by this insatiable infatuation with power, will be the mechanism through which that mirage of a reality will be created in such a perfectly organized microbial way that will blur the lines of our traditional understanding of power and resistance, subjectivity and objectivity. Big Brother is not only watching you from the outside anymore, Big Brother will be lodged deep inside your cognitive faculties as a microbe within the neurons of your frontal lobe where our cognitive functions are processed. This is why I call this first of our concepts psychocodification. It's neither Orwell who can help us, nor the famed post-structuralist French philosopher Michel Foucault, probably the biggest mind of the 20th century. What he called biopower was already intrusive as Foucault conceptualized power as a gliding phenomenon that is omnipresent, power as a projectile that would discipline and govern our bodies in an immensely flexible and sophisticated manner. But even Foucault's biopolitics was naive, too hinged upon the benign forms of governmentality in the latter half of the 20th century. The technological opportunities of today, and more exponentially in the future, deliver something that the 20th century state could only dream of. 
full microorganismal psychocodification of the individual, which allows for a recoding of subjectivity that is near total. Power is not only a gliding projectile with immense velocity anymore. Power is becoming as digestible and penetrative as liquid. Be as water, the famed actor Bruce Lee once said. You must be shapeless, formless, like water. When you pour water in a cup, it becomes the cup. When you pour water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. When you pour water in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Water can drip and it can crash. Become like water, my friend, Bruce Lee said. In our case, power in a liquidized form takes the shape of whatever it enters, and by that, it becomes almost invisible. This is a new form of bio-insecurity for humanity, which threatens to turn us into Nosferatus of the governing elites on that canvases for that perfectly staged untruth that we will accept as reality because we are coded from head to toe to do so. The future of society and the individual entangled within it is the future of control on an unimaginable scale. Our near-total psychocodification is accompanied by a surveillance regime that can only be characterized as microbial exactly because it's aquatic, shapeless and formless, to use Bruce Lee's analogy. This microbial surveillance is our second concept. As we are tiptoeing into a future where we'll be living around cities, densely controlled, by sensors, cameras, and drones tracking our every movement. We will be total objects of power, certainly in the public sphere, much in the same way as Spielberg's Minority Report postulated. In this regard, the future is already here. For instance, a so-called smart digital billboard in London's Piccadilly Circus equipped with inbuilt cameras, use responsive recognition technology to display targeted advertisements based on gender, the age of passing pedestrians, or the make of their cars. In Hangzhou, a city of over 9 million people in the east of China, an AI-driven smart city system has been in place since 2016. It uses big data and machine learning to monitor every vehicle in the city. As we are quickly becoming avatars in a SimCity-like simulation, our every movement can be tracked by a combination of highly intrusive AI-driven technology. Such video game style visualization could easily link up to your social media profile, your family pictures stored in your cloud services, and your Alexa at home, perusing your shopping habits, augmenting your voice and favorite music. Imagine a smart city HQ, where technocrats would sit and say, oh, this is what he likes, oh, that's where his girlfriend lives, and interesting, so that's where he hides things. Our lives as avatars in a virtual reality, pre-programmed and mapped out on the neuronal pathways of electrodes that are lodged in our immediate social reality and absorbed as such by our frontal cortex. And doesn't this dialectic between AI technology-driven surveillance systems and the individual demand a new philosophical approach that appreciates the realm of post-humanity? Doesn't it beget a new dimension of social angst as the lines between mensch and robot are increasingly blurred. We are already becoming accustomed to talking to our digital assistants as if they are human. Some of us are starting to treat them as cyber friends, even therapists and confidants. 
These devices are created in order to be compliant. They lack the human intuition, can only develop through self-reflection. In this sterilized, narcissistic world, where machines substitute our social relationships and turn into devout objects of our desires, deep human connections are increasingly inhibited. Posthumanity is not only a theme with social consequences. The most sinister impact of AI-driven technology will be on the battlefield, in that realm of human activity where questions of life and death are determined by a split-second decision. Post-human warfare, this is our third concept. Already, civilians are routinely killed by military drones piloted by humans. In the future, we will face a mode of warfare that compounds the problem of killing without accountability. Imagine swarms of quadcopter killer drones, which are only a very small technological advance away. It's not only terrorists that could easily get their hands on such technology, but such AI-driven terror bots open up immensely challenging questions about ethics in the battlefield. Our current legal system, certainly even the Geneva Convention, seem woefully outdated to deal with an army of ex machina style terminators that are programmed to kill. Once these forms of new post-human warfare are developed and deployed, they become factors in world politics, and not only for us, but also for homicidal movement that are summarized under the label terrorist. How willing are the tech giants and how capable are governments to confine their profits and power in order to institute an ethical code of conduct that would harmonize some of the battle lines that are already opening up between human and machine? For a rather more responsible approach to prevail, we need a global movement with local manifestations that makes the case for a peaceful deployment of AI-driven technology. Where there is power, there is always resistance. Making the case that AI technology is only progressive, even admissible, when it helps us in fighting poverty, famines, environmental degradation and war is the future task of all of us. It may well be the cosmic battle of the next generations that will decide the survivability of human civilization as we know it. Great. Um, I was about to say thank you for that, um, but he's not here to be thanked. Um, out of my lively voice. Um, the reason why I decided to show this, um, despite Ashen not being able to, to be present with us, is because I think it raises some interesting questions and because I think that we might be able to, to discuss this further. Um, but now as we enter the discussion section of this uh, panel discussion, uh, I was hoping that maybe Graham or Anton, you would have some comments that you would want to make about each other's presentation, maybe some things to expand on or on some things in the in the video that Ashwin has sent to us. I have a comment to make to Anton. <clears throat> and yes, you're right. During the past year, universal basic income has seemed more and more plausible for various reasons and maybe even inevitable. Um, what do you say to the worry that this basic income will simply be captured by landlords? No, definitely. I think it's a legitimate political question um, and almost a strategic question for people who are pushing the proposal from within different coalitions. It's not just landlords, of course. I mean, there are horrible stories that many of the relief measures that are in the Biden package are actually going straight into the hands of debt collectors as well. So we know that certainly in the global south, 
many of these favelas, which Jared Bolsonaro sends his checks to, are swarming with uh, people who are interested in extortion, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just a question of landlords, because housing is a particularly unequal um, economic sector, but it applies to so many uh, privatized public goods that people now have to pay for, and which cash relief might just end up uh, exacerbating because it creates this dynamic where, for example, landlords now check up at the local social security office whether people are eligible for checks and then they notify people after receipt that they have to pay their rent with the check they just received, which means that it stimulates the economy in an, increased, in an increasingly narrow way insofar as most of, most of it just disappears into the pockets of rentiers. But I think the strategic question hides a more fundamental philosophical question of what kind of welfare a basic income is proposing. And this is where I think the distinction between abstract and concrete needs is very important. Because if you say humans have a right to housing, then the logical conclusion there is to mainly decommodify the housing market and make sure that the state constructs more social housing. That is a very, very different approach from just giving people money to pay their rent to private landlords. And there, I think it's not just a strategic question, but it's almost a sort of essential question about principle, namely what model of welfare are you putting forward? And what kind of attack on the market does this model of welfare actually imply? And it's clear that social housing actually means taking on private developers, et cetera, et cetera, and forcing the state to build itself rather than just making the state pay money so that people can pay their private landlords. That's helpful. But that leads to my next question, which is once you once the population is merely a recipient of a universal basic income, what are the dangers that the, the government will then insert itself in deciding how many people there should be. And you know, there's been talk about trying to control the human population anyway, uh, but until now, the decision to reproduce has been largely left to individuals. Uh, if we're all getting checks, what's to stop the government from treating us as, a, as something they, that they can calculate and curtail according to the available resources? Yes, I think there there's a sort of double-edged sword insofar as even these other welfare programs I'm talking about, whether it's social housing or free education, et cetera, et cetera, um, require a certain degree of mappability. So the fact that a state knows its citizens or knows what its society looks like, um, which is a, such a massive problem in the US that, for example, a lot of the state just didn't know to which bank accounts it needed to send this cash relief, which is itself an indication of the lack of uh, sort of general knowledge rather than local knowledge in that Hayekian sense. So I don't think mappability or knowability is in itself a problem. I think the bigger danger with basic income once it's instituted is that it's also very, very easy to deconstruct because it goes hand in hand with the deconstruction of other welfare programs that disappear. And once it's in place, it's very easy just to reduce the numbers because it's on a quantitative sliding scale. While, for example, if you have union power in place or you have social housing, you can't just destroy social housing. You can sell it off, but Thatcher had to take quite a while to liquidate the entire municipal council housing stock in the UK. And it wasn't that easy to privatize. While the issue with basic income is once it's in place and it's replaced all those other benefits, you can just like pull down the scale and make it very, very hard for people to actually resist that kind of political move. And there, as you say, the issue of um, who decides on life and death through basic income institution is very, very frightening. And I don't think what I want to contemplate all the possible scenarios that come with that. Thank you. Thank you guys for that. Um, I see that we have a question from Michael, go ahead. Yeah, so I thought I'd just um, come in on a, on a point there that Graham, you made during that discussion. So you said about um, if we're gonna follow this, um, this platform structure, uh, policy goal of universal basic income, what is then to stop states from then exerting uh, greater control over what we do with our lives and how we live them. Um, and my question to you is, is, do you not think that that is precisely what they do now through their control of material conditions that, um, uh, for example, uh, how they tax in certain ways where they put uh, uh, government capital and how they legislate uh, so how they create um, our, our world through, through, through legal norms. Is that not precisely affecting our material conditions now? How many children you have often is a direct consequence of how much money you have in terms of being able to raise them. So do you not think that we're already in that kind of dystopian world of state power anyway? To some extent, but there's also some leeway for us to find space to make private decisions anyway. Whereas I think if we are all simply... I'm, I'm worried. I'm worried that if we're all simply receiving checks, we become essentially children of the state 
And I could easily imagine things like forced sterilization if uh, the production of more humans was seen as a liability to the financial sustainability of the whole system. And we're not there yet. So however bad you think the current situation is, it could get a lot worse if the state has, and I'm saying this as someone who favors universal basic income. I think something like this has to happen. We saw this during COVID, how important this was to people. And it was, it was an in, insufficient amount here in the United States. You couldn't live off of it. Uh, but I, I worry about the alibi this would give the states to make even more invasive decisions. Yeah, I, I agree. I think things can, I, I'm quite a pessimist. I think things can always get worse. But mm -hmm. I, I think the idea that, so for example, in the UK, the effects of austerity has seen, you know, tens of thousands, possibly even hundreds of thousands of deaths. So I think uh, the idea that um, the, the idea of UBI posing this dystopian world in which the, the state will very clearly do X, Y, and Z to affect our material, our material existence. I would argue that that's just being done now, but in a more insidious and underhand form that is only then reported after, 10 years after the fact. Thank you for that. Um, we have two more questions. Um, we have Will and then Jojo. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment about that um, exchange that you guys just had. And um, it's really interesting you talking about um, the state uh, having um, more of an influence over uh, population numbers. Um, but a, an interesting thing is that, at least in Europe and in the US, um, fertility and um, uh, um, the birth rate has gone down to a historic low. And people usually attribute that to an economic system that makes it more expensive to have children. But there's also good evidence that in pretty much all of our food supply, there are chemicals that disrupt our hormonal and reproductive systems. So some people argue that this effort to reduce population has been done in a covert way over the last 50, 60 years since the Second World War. Just wondered if you had any comments about that. Anton, would you like to go first or? It's actually my first time hearing that theory, Will. Doesn't seem totally implausible, but uh, my first time confronting that theory. Uh, I, I had always assumed that any chemical disruption to, to human reproduction was an unintentional byproduct. I hadn't considered the possibility that someone was already making this decision at a deep level for us. I think the discounting of the economic factors in, in the declining birth rate, although it leads to very, very nasty forms of alarmism on the right, et cetera, et cetera, um, does indicate a real fact that certainly for the US with the declining birth rate, um, which shouldn't just be the object of sort of lamentation because we're certainly for Republicans, we're not producing enough white people. Um, but a lot of women are choosing not to have kids because they're economically not capable of doing it. And there is just a real question of what kind of conditions you create for people to make those choices on, on a certain level. And there you don't have to prescribe or you don't have to impose certain models that people need to have kids, um, which was, of course, across the 20th century, such a nasty tendency you saw with some of those welfare states that they basically tied the, rece um, the receipt of welfare to a certain kind of biopolitical function, almost in the Foucauldian sense. But even today, there needs to be a question of like, how do we make it possible for for people to make those life choices, whether they want to have kids or they don't want to have kids. Great, thank you. Um, Jojo? Yes, uh, so my question is was kind of one that's a bit more tangentially related to what uh, has been discussed so far, but has been uh, hinted at, I think, by, my, I think by all of the speakers so far. And my, it's really more a question of like the the status of the state in the wake of in the wake of artificial intelligence, because uh, I think like in political theory, there's currently this, this debate about uh, the move from governance uh, from government to governance. And then to this end, I recently I read an article quite recently by uh, Peter Sol where he he was trying to uh, examine the role that private military companies play in violent conflict, where among the other things he notes a kind of incremental role in private military uh, companies and ensuring the military effectiveness of particular 
uh, client conflict that they are ascribed to. But then he also seems to argue and, and, and also seem to point to the fact that the mere involvement of private military companies in conflict contributed to, I guess, their incremental role in the provision of security and defense. And then my question is like, say we, ha we have artificial, and say like you, the, the rise of artificial intelligence uh, uh, helps or, or contributes to this effectiveness of, I guess, military military operations. And, I, then, and I'm just curious to see how that might impact, uh, I guess, private military companies. But also the question of, you know, like if private military companies keep uh, keep increasing in their in their competencies as much as they do on a military level, to what extent this might um, challenge or pose a kind of infringement on the state's monopoly on violence? And uh, may I don't know to what extent we can uh, ascribe uh, the state's legitimacy uh, right currently in the, the state's political political legitimacy in its in its. Uh, in its, I guess, monopoly on violence, but say you had sub-state actors infringing on its monopoly on violence. What, what, what does that mean for the action of like states? To what extent should, be, should we really be, and I think that's something, I think Graham, you pointed out, to what extent should we really be worrying about the actions of the states? And maybe are we not ignoring too much, ignoring the, the, the competencies of sub-state actors too much in the debate about the rise of AI? Yes, I guess I suppose that's my question. <laughs> a bit. Uh... Great question. Um, did you have any specific sub-state actors in mind? Um, yes, I. Um, then my what I currently have particularly in mind is in private military companies. Um, well, yeah, this, you know, I think it's they're an interesting example because they are so unlike other sub-state actors in that they're, so, they're quite decentralized, uh, I mean, extremely decentralized. They're just really the matter of like, where you hide them and then they, they do whatever, but yeah. Yeah, the, the Afghanistan war is now winding down. Biden announced that all American soldiers will be out by September 11th and NATO is going to follow. And I mean, that's the end of a 20 year war. And I suppose that, that war is all about that paradox, isn't it? That, that Afghanistan was attacked due to the actions of Al-Qaeda, which is not uh, completely overlap of the Afghan state. It was being supposedly hosted by the Afghan state. And then last night on the news in the United States, they were talking about another problem with the Afghanistan war, which is that the Taliban was uh, often based in Pakistan, even though the military presence was in Afghanistan. And so there was an international component there too, that the attack on Afghanistan couldn't really address. And so, yeah, I think we're already seeing large militaries, even of superpower countries, having a difficult time dealing with sub-state actors and the violence capable of being unleashed by them. And of course, there's always been drug traffickers and, and the mafia and things like that. Um, in terms of how artificial intelligence might affect that, I'm not sure. Uh, Obviously, there's there's some evidence that the government is using artificial intelligence and data mining to help target some of these groups. But what about these groups themselves using artificial intelligence to rival the power of the state? That's something I've thought less about. Sorry, you've asked an important question here, and I'm uh, it's it's hard to rise to the level of that question. And the only thing I want to add, maybe, is also to indicate a sort of similar effect on AI we discussed on politics or the, the desire to automate decision-making, which has now been rising in the desire to automate warfare, which we say with the drone revolution, et cetera, et cetera. But supposedly it makes warfare more neutral, more impartial and supposedly less endemic and it proposes more technically efficient solution to the problem. But what most drone warfare has done is that it has created these forever or perpetual wars. It actually does increase the dominance of particular political actors, and it doesn't take the politics out of war at all. So there is a there is a fact, as you say, that the privatization of certain functions of the warfare state is one development we should pay attention to. But the other is indeed the application to, of AI to warfare. But it's not an anti-political solution to warfare. It has its own secret politics to it, which we should never let go of. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for both of your answers. It's just, yeah, I guess, and maybe it's a bit too much, too big of a question to tackle in the final spans of our, of our, of our, of our, 
of our event, but yeah, I think it allows for further 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 thought on this. Great. Um, I'm conscious that we have now reached the time capacity that we we had set. Um, I just want to make just a quick comment about um, about the conversation about food maybe being affected um, in in a way that that harms fertility. Um, I just want to yeah sorry. Uh, some of the things that have been shown to cause this is something like ketone, um, which is really common in the French West Indies, but also in some places in America. But it, it doesn't seem to be that the use of it has been purposefully to cause infertility. It seems to be that the use of it was for profit to increase uh, production of like things like bananas. Um, and that one of the side effects is infertility or prostate cancer. Um, so I just wanted to clear that up. Um, also, just so if it's okay with you guys, I have a question. Um, I understand if, if it's not, um, and then we can wrap that up. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I have a question about the place of AI in uh, perpetuating ableism in a really dangerous way. And my question stems from, I recently find out, found out that there's a way to treat uh, Tourette syndrome with the installation of a DPS inside of the body of, of a person that sends electrolytes into the, the brain in order to kind of calm the person's um, tics. I don't know how you say them in English, but uh, I'm sure you understand. I was just wondering, how is it, uh, what, what position could the state take um, if there's such a thing as like a state welfare with regards to healthcare on individuals like this, as we know that, that, that individuals that are ill in that way are often unproductive for society and like subject to, to not, I mean, being treated fairly. I've explained that really poorly, but I'm just wondering that kind of has AI in it, but also this question of state welfare. And if we move towards a universal basic income that leads to the collapse of the healthcare system, for instance, what does that, how does that put in danger people with illnesses like Tourette's? Well, in, in some sense, though, I think that uh, artificial intelligence is, is the, the neurodiversity movement's dream, isn't it? Because uh, not only will it enable us perhaps to appreciate more the diversity that we have, but it will allow the, the uh, wild proliferation of diverse neural experiences. That, I'm, that's what I'm seeing as a sub-singularity outcome. The fact that we can augment our intelligence in different ways with uh, computerized devices, being able to see different things, being able to, to uh, process information cognitively in a different way. Uh, so in a way, I think it could work out in favor of, of as I put it, the neurodiversity movement. By, by enabling even so-called normal people to experiment with all different types of, of sensory and cognitive experience. Yeah, I think I would love a little to add what Graham said there. I think one interesting observation people have made with the rise of Zoom as a sort of ultimate communicator for so many people during time of lockdown is that it's paradoxically acquainting a lot of people who are able-bodied and don't have any experience with being disabled in a specific way, um, with very severe forms of technological dependency that only disabled people were acquainted with before. So obviously that doesn't imply we're all becoming disabled, but we're now experiencing a sense of dependency or a sense of reliance on some of these technological solutions, which only a select group of people before in our society had. But I think what's very clear there is that you need to ask yourself the question that none of this dependency on technology implies dependency on neutral technology. So what you see with the conservative governments in the UK, for example, is that uh, accessibility for disabled people is prioritized and is held as a goal, but for the only reason that you need to get them to work and need to get them off welfare rolls, et cetera, et cetera. So there, the sort of technological solutions that are proposed to being um, not able-bodied um, are actually inflected just by the need to keep to get profits high. So there you have to ask yourself the question, what kind of technology might be suitable for people who 
need it on a certain level, but who don't necessarily want to be forced to work on, on, on that level there. And it's the same with, for example, how Zoom is designed or how all these digital platforms are designed from Amazon to Google to Facebook is that, I mean, you can see this in these recent documentaries, they want to maximize clicks and they want to maximize content because they need to get more consumer data into the system. So just imagine what Facebook would look like if Facebook wasn't dependent on advertising content. I think you, you'd see a very, very different platform. And in the same level, the question of technological dependency is always a political one, namely on what technology do you want to be dependent? Great, thank you. Um, now, yeah, this is, I'm gonna call it the end of the session. I was just wondering if you guys have any final comments, anything you wanna plug maybe? This seems like a really nice group. I wasn't aware of this group until you invited me. I think it was Michael. Thank you. We appreciate that. All right. Anton, you? Nothing? <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, apologies for going over the allocated time slot, and I hope you continue your conversations. I'm afraid that so much of what we talked about is not going to go away anytime soon. It might get better, it might get worse, but it will remain topical. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, that's the end. I'm going to end the session now. <laughs>